Welcome back everyone to another installment of Space This Week, your Monday rundown of all things Starship development, the latest launch events and all the other interesting space news stories from the past week. We have some groundbreaking Starship news, another unfortunate launch failure from Astra and a triple Falcon 9 spectacular. Today's episode has been brought to you by Squarespace, the all-in-one platform to build a beautiful online presence. More on them later. It finally happened! No, not that. Or that. Or that. Man, this is the kind of clickbait I'm competing with, huh? <laughs> yes, at long last, the FAA has finally given Starship the green light for liftoff. It's Orbin time. Kind of. For those new to Starship, it's the biggest, most powerful, and most technically complex rocket ever constructed. If it ends up working as intended, it'll be 100% reusable, expending only its fuel on its journey to space. This has never been done before. Falcon 9 only recovers its first stage and its fairings. The second stage is lost, and the space shuttle was technically reusable, but it had to undergo extensive refurbishment and rebuild between flights, not to mention its massive orange fuel tank was always discarded. So yes, Starship is a very big deal. It's currently being developed here in a small town called Boca Chica in Texas. Now, as you can imagine, this might have a bit of an impact on the local flora and fauna, hence the need for an environmental review. Now, SpaceX did already have full approval from the FAA to launch Falcon Heavy and Falcon 9 from Boca Chica. After all, the initial plan for Boca was Falcon launches. It was decided at relatively last minute to switch to Starship development. So while a review would still be necessary, I think we would have been very surprised if the FAA said no and demanded a full environmental evaluation from the ground up. Anyway, fast forward to last week, after spending more than half a year reviewing all of the public comments and investigating the impact of a full-scale Starship launch, which would involve 33 of the massive Raptor 2 engines firing at once, the FAA ruled that a Starship Super Heavy launch would present no significant impact on the environment, or, in other words, they are happy for the launches to take place. This did come with a few caveats. SpaceX will need to address over 75 actions in the FAA report, which includes things like giving more adequate notice for any launches and road closures, and they will need to play an active role in monitoring the local wildlife populations, including the sea turtles that nest in the nearby areas. You can read the full list of mitigating measures on the FAA's website, but really none of them are that difficult to comply with, and I don't think addressing any of them will directly result in a delay to the orbital launch. Now, to be clear, this is not a green light for orbital Starship flights. SpaceX will still need to apply for a launch license from the FAA, but this will be a trivial process compared to the environmental review. SpaceX have already submitted their intended flight path to the Federal Communications Commission, the rocket will launch from Starbase, and upon stage separation, the massive Super Heavy first stage will splash down into the ocean, using its engines to kill its speed in a very similar fashion to Falcon 9. The Starship upper stage will then continue on, where it will reach a speed just barely shy of orbital velocity, sending it all the way around the Earth before re-entering and soft landing in the Pacific Ocean, about 100 kilometers northwest of Kauai in the Hawaiian Islands. The entire flight from start to finish should take about 90 minutes. Now, the initial plan for the orbital flight test was to use Ship 20 for the upper stage and Booster 4 for the lower stage. Both of these prototypes, however, are powered by the now outdated Raptor 1 engine, so the decision was made to retire these vehicles and switch them for Booster 7 and Ship 24, which both sport the newer Raptor 2 engine, as well as a host of other improvements to their design. So, when will the flight happen? Well, Elon Musk has the rather optimistic view that SpaceX will be ready by July, and then they'll be ready to do it again in August. Me personally, I think this is a little bit optimistic. They still have a few things to do first. Booster 7 will need to undergo a static fire test of its engines first, which is probably the most significant test to look out for. I imagine SpaceX will want to test out Mechazilla's ability to place the booster on the launch pad as well. So far, the chopsticks have only been used to stack the smaller Starship stage, not the bigger, heavier booster. Last week, we did catch SpaceX performing some movement testing of the arms, which we think is in preparation for a booster lift soon. Currently, the booster is sitting inside the mega bay. There it is there. And man, this building is very big. The footprint is a ginormous square space. 
Not to be confused with Squarespace, the amazing website building tool who has very kindly sponsored today's video. Squarespace allows you to build your very own website even if you have zero knowledge of web design or any of that other complicated stuff even the least tech savvy people can use it. Squarespace has a wide range of pre-built templates that you can use as a starting point for your site. Once you've chosen a template you like, you can change everything you want from the logos, texts, fonts, graphics, and more. You can also integrate your social media account into your site and have it automatically show the latest content from your social media profiles. And you can gain powerful insights into who's viewing your site and how they're interacting with it using Squarespace's in-depth analytics tools, which gives you a comprehensive breakdown of traffic sources, time spent on your website, audience demographics, and more. Beyond basic website building, Squarespace also has the ability to set up email campaigns. You can create an email design from a template and personalize it to match your brand, and the service has inbuilt analytics so that you can measure the impact of every single email sent. Head to squarespace.com for a free trial, and when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Go on, you know you want to. <laughs> Now, we talk a lot about Starbase in these videos because, of course, it's where Starship's being developed. And hey look, it's now visible on Google Earth, the satellite imagery finally updated. But I don't talk a lot about Starbase Florida because it's a lot less accessible to the public. However, Greg Scott is helping tear down this secrecy by making regular helicopter flights and photographing the build site. As you can see, there are now five tower segments all built and ready to be stacked at the pad, and you can see that SpaceX are making good progress of the factory building as well, which was recently featured in Elon Musk's render dump on Twitter of all the stuff that SpaceX is working on. Greg also took this shot of pad 39A, where you can see one tower segment has already arrived. It's actually really interesting how you can see the evolution of the Starship Pad 39A site in the background of Falcon 9 launch footage on the official SpaceX streams. Now, in this photo from Greg, we can see this structure. It's not really clear what this could be. It's too tall for a Starship stand, but then I don't really know what else it could be other than possibly a very over-engineered water tower. Its position between the Starship Pad and Pad 39A means that whatever it is, it might be here in order to serve as some sort of shielding from 39A from the Starship Pad, as an exploding full Starship stack could put Pad 39A in some danger. And 39A is incredibly important, as it's currently the only launch pad that Crew Dragon can launch from, which is of course the only human-rated spacecraft operated by the United States. And NASA can ill afford to lose Pad 39A and have to go back to relying on the Russian Soyuz. What do you think this structure could be? Let me know what you think in the comments down below. And hey, while you're down there, do be sure to drop a little like and subscribe, as it really helps support what I do here, and I always do appreciate it. If you can, I'd also recommend checking out Greg Scott's Patreon. These helicopter flyovers aren't cheap, and if we all help chip in, then we can keep him up in the air, supplying us all with development photos. I've put a link for you in the description of this video. On Sunday last week, we saw the launch of Astra's latest Rocket 3 vehicle. This was the seventh overall flight for Astra's rocket, and for last week's launch, the payload fairing contained the first two Tropics CubeSats for NASA. The Tropics constellation will consist of six weather tracking satellites that work together to provide rapid refresh microwave measurements over the tropics, with the six satellites spread over three low Earth orbital planes. The mission started off well, with a successful flight of the rocket's first stage, but then, unfortunately, the upper stage shut down too early, resulting in a loss of payload. NASA has stated that while they're disappointed by the mission failure, this shouldn't impede the objectives of the Tropics constellation overall. Assuming the four remaining satellites launch to orbit successfully, they can still provide time-resolved observations of tropical cyclones compared to traditional observing methods. However, this doesn't really put Astra in an especially comfortable spot. Out of the seven total launches for Rocket 3, only two have successfully reached orbit, and this is now the second NASA payload to be destroyed on an Astra rocket. With less than a third of launches ending in success, we're all starting to wonder if this has just been a string of bad luck, or if Rocket 3 is just a fundamentally unreliable vehicle. What do you think? Will Astra finally get Rocket 3 performing consistently, or are more failures going to come? 
One thing for certain is that Astra can ill afford to paint themselves as an unreliable launch provider, with hot competition from Virgin Orbit and Rocket Lab, both providers having proven their rockets to be dependable vehicles. Astra really need to start stepping up their game. Firefly Aerospace will also be making a second attempt at launching their rocket, the Firefly Alpha, later this year, which, if successful, will put even more pressure on Astra. I'm really hoping that Astra succeed though, competition is never a bad thing, but I think they've really got to boost their success rate here. At least SpaceX's Falcon 9 is a reliable machine. Last week, we saw SpaceX launch their Starlink Group 419 mission. Now at face value, this Starlink mission wasn't particularly different from any of the others. A Falcon 9 delivered 53 Starlink satellites to low Earth orbit. However, this was a very special mission. You might have noticed how blackened this particular booster is. That's because it had already made 12 launches and landings before last week's flight. This mission was the very first time that SpaceX flew a booster for the 13th time. And the old girl pulled it off. And we got a crystal clear view of the landing sequence on the drone ship, a shortfall of gravitas, made possible thanks to the very Starlink network that this rocket contributed to. And if that wasn't enough, this was also the 100th reflight of a booster for SpaceX and the 50th consecutive landing, a record for SpaceX. However, this wasn't the only Falcon 9 launch last week. We also saw the SARA-1 mission launch just one day later on the 18th of June. This saw a Falcon 9 place the SARA-1 radar satellite into a 750km sun-synchronous orbit along with a few other rideshare payloads. SARA-1 is a radar reconnaissance satellite built by Airbus Defence and Space and operated by the German military. The SARA-1 is the first of three SARA satellites. SARA-2 and 3 will be two reflector antenna satellites, which will fly in formation alongside SARA-1 to boost the resolution of the satellite constellation. As for the ride chair payloads, so far there has been no confirmed information regarding these, or if the mission even flew with ride chair payloads in the end. Hopefully we might find out more over the next few days. Shortly after first stage cutoff, we were treated to a spectacular landing zone touchdown of the booster, the third launch and landing for this booster, which previously launched the Enrol 87 and Enrol 85 missions. Now, as if that wasn't enough, SpaceX had to go and launch a third Falcon 9 launch last week, again, one single day after the last meaning we saw three back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back Falcon 9 flights, which is truly amazing. This final mission took place on the 19th of June, and this was the Global Star FM-15 mission. The Global Star satellites work together to provide digital real-time voice, data, and fax transmissions from anywhere around the world, with each satellite weighing around 700 kilograms or 43,750 chicken McNuggets for my American viewers watching. There was a second payload on this mission, the identity of which has not been disclosed, but is believed to be an American military satellite. I would now like to thank all of my Patreon and channel members whose generous financial donations helped me to make this content for you all. If you'd like to join the list of names on screen, then consider checking out the links in the description below or the Patreon card on screen. Don't forget to subscribe as well. On Saturday, I have a new Kerbal video coming, so do keep an eye out for that. Thank you everyone once again for watching, and thank you to Squarespace for sponsoring this video, and I'll see you all next time.